Now, we know with lots of inherited diseases that it favours either boys or girls, and also that there are some differences um, across the world, and certain races may develop different uh, inherited diseases, such as sickle cell. Do you see a difference in gender between boys and girls with this disorder? And are there certain uh, ethnic groups that are more prone to inheriting this disease? Not necessarily. It can equally affect um, girls and boys um, and does not have any um, predilection for certain ethnic groups. So you've already talked about how there's a huge spectrum. We know that with this disease, the younger the child presents, usually the more severe the disorder. Can you tell us a little bit about the spectrum of spinal muscular atrophy? Yes. So we used to actually um, characterize people in terms of types. And uh, we don't so much utilize those types anymore, uh, but historically they were able to allow us to do a couple of things. They were able to allow us uh, to provide prognosis to families so that they could prepare. Um, and they allowed us to be able to characterize patients so that we could put them uh, into uh, opportunities for research because you want to obviously intervene with groups who are similar and then look at outcome. So uh, historically there were types one, two, and three that are the most commonly referred two types and genetically they are the same phenotypically they are different and I think the one that you're referring to that it's most commonly recognized is the type 1 babies that without treatment would essentially pass away definitively before the age of two and um, before we bring Sebastian into our discussion can you tell me a little bit about how patients present to you mm -hmm. obviously parents can jump on the internet and read these huge list of signs and symptoms do you get patients that are referred to you with a suspected diagnosis that turn out not to have spinal muscular atrophy and they have a whole load of potential other issues? Or do most people that you see, the diagnosis is pretty obvious that it's already been missed by a number of months or years already? How do people present to you? It's kind of a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, so in infants uh, who are floppy and weak, uh, with a poor cry and um, a minimal movement of their arms and legs. Uh, I think that by the time they see me, their pediatrician has recognized that there is something that is very worrisome here. And there is this significant disconnect where uh, the brains of our patients with spinal muscular atrophy are very much intact. Uh, and so I have these bright-eyed young children that are cognitively and socially very on track and their bodies cannot keep up with them because this is impacting really just their motor nerves. And so there's this disconnect there. And when I see that disconnect, it becomes very obvious that this is what we're dealing with. That uh, obviousness becomes less so when you have older patients, and Sebastian will share his journey with us, but um, it can often go under-recognized in patients who have achieved the ability to sit on their own and stand on their own, but may have a difference in the way that they accomplish those tasks. And so that could indicate a number of different considerations for diagnosis um, that I also evaluate for. Is there a difference in the brain signal? Is this a CNS problem? Is this a congenital myopathy? Is it a neuromuscular junction problem? And so the differential can be a little broader for our patients who are older. So for patients who come to you, we hear a lot now about concerns with immunizations. There's been a huge amount over the last 25 years written about autism and other medical problems like cerebral palsy. Do you find that these kind of diagnoses are in the differential? for patients that come to you, or is it completely a different set of symptoms? It's completely a different set of symptoms, but to a neurologist. So to a primary care person, they may see that someone is just not keeping up. And the question in their mind may be, are we dealing with cerebral palsy? And so that is where that referral to a neurologist really is incredibly helpful because we can parse out what is upper motor neuron dysfunction, which would be seen in cerebral palsy, and what is lower motor neuron dysfunction, which is seen in the peripheral nervous system, which is my area of expertise. And you've talked about the effect on the nerves, the muscles. Is there a discrepancy between the upper limb, the lower limb? Do you find that certain muscles are more obviously affected, or is this a sort of generic across the board, any muscle can be affected? 
So it's important to keep in mind that any muscle can be impacted. Um, and I think that the most important thing to, uh, to recognize is that it's also not just muscles of the arms and legs, but also the respiratory muscles as well. And so we have ways of measuring their strength over time because that plays a huge role in the health of our patients. Um, but if we're purely looking at a physical examination, there does tend to also be a pattern whereby the lower limbs tend to be um, more significantly impacted than the upper limbs. So obviously walking and I guess when patients are slow to crawl or go from sitting to standing, that's when you see exactly. the issues.